Hello. Hi, Aloha, Klaus. Is this Dave? It is. Aloha, my brother. Hi, Dave. This is Klaus. How are you doing? I'm good, man. Thank you for asking yourself. All right. Can so you're calling from uh, Honolulu? I am calling from Honolulu, in fact. It's amazing. It's an amazing connection. It's one of the... C I was thinking to myself, it sounds clear, more clear than most of the connections uh, with the interviews that I do with anyone. So. Okay. <laughs> I'm surprised that it sounds so clear myself. Um, and uh, so you can hear me crystal clear. I don't need to turn it up or anything. Amazing. Okay, great. Just checking, making sure. <laughs> making sure. So this is a radio station uh, in Honolulu, and and it'll be broadcast throughout the state on um, of Hawaii, and then it'll be on online too. Um, okay. And I'll just put a short introduction on it, just making sure. But it, it's taped right now, right? Correct. We're not live on the radio. Yeah. Okay. Ab cool. Absolutely not. So and I hope we have a chance to come back to Honolulu and play a show. It's been a long, long time. Ah, uh, well, I hope that you, you can too, Klaus. Believe me, brother. Huh? I hope that you can too. Uh, that would be great. I'm sure people would really appreciate getting to see you again. Um, yeah. So uh, let me just put a short, <coughs> a short introduction on this. Okay, brother. Okay. Thank you. Um, All right. Aloha, it's Dave Lawrence. Today we're welcoming a legendary rock vocalist, and he's also a guitarist and songwriter. He's got the distinction of being his band's lead vocalist continuously since 1970 and you have to really think about that in your life not just as a musician or an entertainer but just as anyone any one of us to imagine doing the same thing with the same brand to achieve success the longevity that he's enjoyed and experienced is really something to explore every record since 1972 the latest is unplugged recently certified gold in an era when few albums can sell they've got over 100 million albums to their credit the band is the scorpions you're familiar with the name i doubt you're familiar with their vocalist he's a delight to get to speak to uh, hello and welcome to klaus Mina from the scorpions aloha klaus hello dave how are you doing i'm very good and and is that the correct pronunciation of your name yeah, perfect. Good, making sure <laughs> that's one of those names that you don't... And that's the thing that's kind of wild about you. You've been such a mainstay in so many people's lives, but as a singer, as a person, as an individual, not so much. Yeah, I mean, when, when you're a lead singer in the band, you know, it's, it's always a, the, 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 the name of the band that goes around the world, and it's only for the diehard fans, I think, they can identify each member. Yeah, it's, there's some of that in there. It, it, I've always been curious why that is. You were my second ever concert, so I must confess to you, I had almost every Scorpions record as a little boy, and it was really an influential moment. So it, it is a delight that you would take some time. I really am grateful that, that you would. You're a, uh, a, oh, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it's been a long time that we, we played a show in Honolulu. You know, it's it's quite some time ago, and uh, we hope uh, celebrating uh, 50 is the 50th anniversary of the Scorpions next year. <laughs> it's hard to believe, but since Rudolf Schenker started the band in 65, it's 50 years next year, and uh, we're planning on a new album, on a movie, and playing some shows around the world, and it would be fantastic if we had a chance to come back to, to Hawaii. When was your first time here? What are your memories of playing Hawaii? I think it's, uh, we played there... Uh, I think it was uh, back in the 80s. It was the early 80s. And uh, we stayed uh, in Honolulu. We played a concert there. And it, I think it was fantastic. And uh, we, we uh, stayed for some extra days. I think we went to Maui. What a beautiful island. And had, had a wonderful time there. And we were on the way to Japan, you know, and then we kept going uh, for the Asian leg of the tour and played some shows in, in Asia, and uh, it's a wonderful memory, you know, and, uh, but being here in Germany, you know, it, it's, it's a long trip, you know, but we miss the vibe, you know, it's, uh, the people are so friendly, and uh, we, all, we felt really welcome, you know, when we ar arrived and and when we arrived in Honolulu, and uh, you know, you, they put the flowers around your neck, and the whole thing, the vibe and the smell, <laughs> it's just uh, all the flowers. It's it's beautiful. It's in the air, and the colors are just amazing. You know, you always had a strong connection early on with Asia too, which is kind of uh, a related thing, certainly where Honolulu is in the world. 
and uh, yeah. very a- Asian-based kind of a- uh, part of the world. When you think about, when you were describing the friendliness here and the way people are uh, here, it sounded sort of like some of the interviews I've read where you described the crowd in Athens where uh, Unplugged was recorded. I'm wondering about, uh, I've been looking at the, the set list of it and, and both the CD and DVD version, a bit different. Obviously, the DVD is including a, a bit more. Um, try to recall the process, if you can, for me, Klaus, of selecting those songs and any discussions or experiments with Rudy and the guys relating to that. Yeah, we were experimenting. And I mean, I tell you, when this MTV Unplugged uh, offer came up here in Germany from MTV Berlin, uh, we were totally excited about it. And uh, I mean, we, we were talking about doing MTV back in the 80s, but it never really worked out. And so this came up uh, early 2013. And we thought it would be so cool to, to do it in Athens, in Greece. And uh, so it, uh, it turned out to be the, the very first uh, MTV Unplugged Under the Open Sky. And it was such a wonderful setting at the Likabetos Amphitheater, uh, which is, is a mountain in the city of Athens. And uh, we thought about to really come with a special set of music, a lot of songs we, we haven't played before in our career, some new stuff, new material, and uh yeah it 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 the whole bit was it was a, a challenge and uh, the, the biggest challenge though was to to perform uh, a show that uh about two two and a half hours to perform a show sitting on bar stools you know <laughs> <laughs> this is what the mtv people <laughs> wanted to have for this kind of format and uh so that was very different for a rock band going crazy every night on stage, running around uh, to, to sit two and a half hours on a bus stool. But it was, you know, only about music, uh, not about the big rock pose. It was about the music only, and it was a wonderful experience. And we had, we had a fantastic time with our fans in Greece. And through this uh, DVD and uh, through the video, we share it with our fans around the world. Who was it who chose Athens, and any particular previous memories came to mind when you were there from your other times there in Greece? I mean, I think like in many other countries around the world, we have a a, a very loyal following uh, in Greece, and uh, I I think part of it we went to Greece was because we always had the feeling the Greek fans are very much into our early material. You know, they they like the songs that uh, were written before all the big mainstream hits. And so they have a big heart for songs like Born to Touch Your Feeling, uh, Speed is Coming, Pictured Life, some 70s stuff from the early days, you know. And, uh, and they are very emotional. And uh, playing those songs and also songs we never performed live before, like When You Came Into My Life, you could feel in the audience it, it was just amazing. You could, you could see it, you know, when you watch the DVD. And so we had lots and lots of memories uh, because we went through Greece uh, many times uh, before, since the 70s, 80s, I think. And we played big stadium shows there in Athens or uh, went to Thessaloniki and some other places. But this was like a, more a theater, an amphitheater, where the capacity was uh, around 8,000. But for this MTV, for the show, they cut it down to three, 4,000. Uh, when you think of this MTV format, you know, then it's mostly it's been recorded in studios with a few hundred fans gathering around the stage. So this was very different. It was out in the under the open sky, open air, and it, it was in front of 3,000 people. And after the recordings, we played a, a third night where it was packed with 8,000 fans. So we have a long history with our Greek fans, and we might go there next year. The venue looks uh, stunning with the trees and, you know, when you try to paint a picture of the outdoor, uh, the vibe, as you you know, you've used the word, but it certainly must be uh, the right word for this because you think about that Mm -hmm. energy. I looked at it and it really looks stunning. The columns, it gives it that historic feel tapping into maybe the history of that city. Um, And the other thing about it that I was curious, maybe more as a fan, 
the arrangements. There are just some really radical string, vocal, other collaborative arrangements. When you were mentioning the the emotional impact, I thought of the Absolutely. Greek the Greek actress yeah. who cries during the moment where she has the speaking role in one, one of the yeah, tunes. Yeah, I mean that was amazing. You know, it was so funny. We we said for both of such a feeling for this uh, speaking part in the end of the song. That's the way it's 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 been recorded. In the 70s, uh, we, went through, we were thinking about like a, a, a Greek actress, you know, to, to speak uh, those words. And uh, so when we met uh, Dimitra Kokuri uh, for the first time, so we asked uh, our promoter, is she very famous in Greece? And he went, no, no, she's, she's a young actress, you know, but when she, she comes to your show, she will be very famous. <laughs> so she did an amazing job, and she was... She was very emotional, you know, and uh, I mean, talking about arrangements, uh, Matthias Jabs, our lead guitarist, uh, he went to Stockholm since we, we are working uh, in the last couple of years. We have a Swedish producer team, and so the arrangements uh, came all about uh, between uh, mostly Matthias and uh, uh, Martin Hansen and Michael North Anderson, our Swedish producers, and we were doing this between Hanover here in Germany and uh, uh, Stockholm in Sweden. And that was the idea, you know, to not to play the songs the way the fans know them, but to come up with a whole different arrangement and present even the rock songs, the, the big classics like No One Like You or Rock You Like a Hurricane, to present them in totally different setup with different instruments. We're using mandolins a lot. We had a string octet. Uh, Greek musicians, they were just fabulous, you know, and they added an amazing sound. Uh, the, the the strings from heaven, uh, that's like uh, we call them. And uh, so it was a great set of musicians. Uh, I think we shared the stage. We were in total 18 musicians, and then we had some guest, guest, guest artists joining us for a couple of songs. So it was... Uh, it was so different the, the whole uh, show and the whole setup, and uh, but the idea was really to create a whole whole new concept, a whole new concert, <clears throat> and uh, go through songs in, in the history of Scorpions, going all the way back to the seventies, and we played songs like "Speed Is Coming," you know, "Can't Live Without You," and, and songs we we. So, some of them never played live before, you know, like Passion Roots, the game, it's a song back from the 80s, uh, because uh, it, you need uh, more than one singer to perform that song in the right way. And we had, uh, with our uh, Greek uh, and uh, Swedish gang, we had, uh, the musicians, we had also amazing backing vocal singers, and so we could, could pull off uh, some songs and, and perform them live uh, the way we never did it before or it was for some of them like Passion Roots again for the very first time. It was a great experience, and it's been about fun, you know, and, and enjoy the music and uh, give our fans around the world something completely different, uh, far away from the uh, turned-up to 11 Marshall stack, you know. <laughs> <laughs> this was very different. A, a lot of fun, and we enjoyed it, and it looks like our fans too. The approach really is different. Uh, a lot of musicians joining you on stage are very different. Uh, a lot of the arrangements have a flair and a feel that give them a... It, it sounds like you put work into it, and it doesn't sound like, uh, as you put it, you know, somebody just playing the same, the same old thing. And when I think about your life... Um, what was it that kicked this all off? You mentioned going back, and this set list does include some old material. It made me think of what got you in the beginning, Klaus, to want to start singing. Who was it who recognized the talent in you that you had this? Uh, well, I think that was pretty much like a family affair. Uh, you know, like uh, for Christmas or birthdays, uh, with a family, with your parents, uh, with your grandma, you know, and that's sometime at night. I might have been six, seven years old, maybe it was, uh, oh, come on, Klaus, sing Ave Maria for us, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and little Klaus jumped up on a chair, and it was my little stage, and uh, performed uh, something like Ave Maria, you know. And then you get some feedback, and uh, I think I was not 10 years old, and I knew that I wanted to be a singer in my life, you know, and uh, that was what I wanted to do.
where there you you have a great reference point in terms of the content that you were singing how did the rock arrive what were the the earliest influences as taking you from Ava Maria to contemporary <laughs> yeah. I mean uh, in the early uh, 60s you know and uh, I was in my, my teenager years and was 15 16 and I think it was when uh the Beatles, the Stones, the Who, all these great British bands uh, came over the world like a like a rock and roll revolution, you know. And uh, I mean, I, I between Ave Maria and the Beatles or Led Zeppelin, it, it was of course it was Elvis, you know. And uh, I think Elvis had a great show in Honolulu uh, back in the days as well, right? Yeah, Aloha and, from Hawaii. Yeah, yeah, and so it was Elvis, it was Little Richard, uh, Jerry Lee Lewis, all those guys. Uh, they were definitely an early influence in uh, talking about rock and roll, you know, and to be inspired about rock music. Uh, but then the early 60s, when, when I heard the Beatles for the very first time and, and the Stones, this is when we really, when I really uh, was turned on to, to rock music, and it never left me until to, up to today. And uh, then, during the 60s, I had my very first band, The Mushrooms, and The Scorpions started also in 65, you know, and uh, with Rudolf. And, yeah, and, and we met each other, of course, and I, I knew I, I had a soul brother there. And there was a guy who and we shared the same vision. We had the same dreams, you know, the, the same rock and roll dream. And uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, I joined the Scorpions with, with Rudolf's brother Michael, and, uh, well, the rest is history, so to speak. But that is something that is, I mean, that partnership really is what has made a lot of bands last, but I guess in terms of your particular role as I when I introduced you, and I'm hoping you can reflect a little on the fact that if you step back a little and don't just look at the fact as you're a singer or an entertainer, but just look at, you know, the craft that you do and you do it under the brand, the Scorpions. How many people in your life, Klaus, can say they've been doing the same brand successfully since 1970 of anything? <laughs> No. no, I mean, you know, seriously, when you think about, because I want to, when I, when I, I, I know. when I try to present this to listeners and I think about the, really, there's something way beyond the scorpions I'm hoping I can tap into. Just as when you, is it humbling at all when you stop and think about the longevity of the, of your employment with this opportunity? Yeah, it is. It is. But I mean, uh, Dave, the, uh, it's not only the scorpions. Uh, it's just the very few bands like the Stones or Aerosmith. There are a few bands out there. They have this longevity as well, you know, and, uh, but it's a very few around the world, you're right. And I tell you, the best thing about being that long with, with, with a brand or being with a band, you know, and, and, and still, uh, I, I mean, Rudolf Schenker, Matthias Jahn, Matthias uh, is in the band since 78, you know, it's a, today it's the three of us looking back on, on a really long, long career. Uh, but the best thing is, after all these years, that right now, 2014, we're in a studio and we're writing songs and preparing this anniversary coming up next year, and we still feel the same passion for the music, and we still uh, enjoy what we're doing, you know. And I think this is like really like a miracle, you know. We have our ups and downs, of course, over the years, and... Uh, well, you know, in a long career, sometimes you go through difficult times like the 90s with alternative music, I guess, was a challenge for, for every classic rock band uh, on earth, you know. So, but we survived the 90s and uh, we, we were back. And there's a whole new audience. And today, every show we're doing uh, mostly in, in Europe or Eastern Europe, Russia or in, in South America, uh, it's a young audience, you know. It's a mixed audience playing in front of three generations, which is wonderful. It's a little bit different than the United States because uh, a little bit you're stuck in the, in the 80s kind of format. We, I think we have a very loyal fan base in, in America, and I hope we have a chance to come back to the U.S. next year. Uh, but uh, in the rest of the world, uh, it's also a, a young audience that is coming to our shows, uh, young kids in front of the stage and uh, singing songs that were written uh, even before they were born, you know. And it's very inspiring and motivating uh, to see that we we're close to six, six million uh, 
uh, users on, on Facebook, you know, and uh, the, the average uh, age is between 18 and 28 or something. You know, that's, that's pretty amazing. It shows that this kind of music um, is timeless. And as an artist, when, when you go out there and, and wherever you go in the world and you deliver a great show, you know, and uh, I think this is also a young generation, they, they appreciate it very much and have a, have a good time. You really have a, uh, it is timeless. It's also very international in a way that defies perhaps other bands that are, there's a lot of bands, like you said, that have a certain degree of success, but there are uh, peculiar, peculiar um, traits about the Scorpions when you take a, cl a closer look at it. One of them is that international appeal that you have had and focusing a little bit on some of those unusual gigs. I watched some of the videos and I was curious about the times that, uh, or the time at least that you played in Israel and even performed with that Israeli artist, Leo Colette, and maybe if you could just share how that came about, and anything you learned from that, anything that felt strongly, that, that, that maybe touched you deeply inside? I, you know, I think, Dave, it was very touching, uh, playing in Israel, playing, playing in the Middle East anyway, you know, going to places like Cairo, where I played in front of the pyramids, uh, to play in Lebanon, you know, and, and play in Tel Aviv, of course. And when you see through the eyes of the person on stage, through the eyes of the artist, uh, singing to audiences in all these countries in, in the Middle East, and you, you see the emotions, and it's, it's all the same. You know, people react the same in the same way. They might be enemies in the, in the real world, and what you see in the news every night, but from the singer's point of view on a stage, they sing along with all their heart and soul, the same songs with the same passion, the same emotions, with the tears in their eyes when we play a peace anthem like Wind of Change, you know, uh, you get the same feeling. And this is like an experience you go through, coming through these countries, where you can feel that music uh, has such a strong positive power connecting people and that's what the scorpions also always try to build bridges between countries cultures and uh, yeah and music is a very powerful tool very positive tool to bring people together for a more peaceful world and you feel that especially in places like like tel aviv when you play in israel and tel aviv uh, or you go to lebanon you know and uh, you can feel the tension uh, but also you, you, you find an audience in a young generation, and they have enough of war. They, they are just looking for peace, for a peaceful future, you know. And, uh, and you can feel it when you're on stage there. And, uh, and, and songs are a little like Wind of Change. And these days we're celebrating the 25th anniversary of the coming down of the Berlin Wall. Uh, but... Going to the Middle East, uh, uh, the, the song, even though it's a song about Moscow, you know, I follow the Moskwa, uh, it's, the people feel it's, it's, about, it's about hope, hoping for a peaceful world, you know, and, and that's very touching. It's an international resonance is what you're saying about that song. That, yes. That that vibe goes anywhere, wind of change. It's just, uh, it's like, it's universal. And of course, it was a wonderful experience to, to work with Liel Colette. Uh, she joined us on stage when we played in Tel Aviv. Uh, we did a TV show together. I was singing Send Me an Angel uh, with her. And she's a wonderful, young, talented, very, very talented uh, singer and wonderful artist. And uh, so it's always great if you have a chance to, to work with, with with artists uh, in, in other cultures, you know, and it, it's one, a wonderful thing. It's very inspiring. It's great how you use so many other languages on stage, Klaus. I don't know if you realize how few other bands maybe take the time uh, to do what you've done. It may be going all the way back to Tokyo tapes, the way that you would interact with the audience. It, was it just something you did out of respect? <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> yeah, I mean, I remember in Tokyo tapes, it was the first time we went to Japan, and I think uh, I asked our Japanese fan club at the time, so how about if I would sing a Japanese song with, with the Japanese fans? And uh, 
like a folk song, something uh, traditional, something like that. And they had sent me a song called Kojonotsky. It's about an old castle, the moon over the castle or something. And uh, so I learned that song, and uh, we, I, I, I sang it in, in Tokyo, uh, and uh, it ended up uh, on, on Tokyo tapes on that live album uh, we did in 78 uh, in, in uh, Tokyo, some Plaza Hall. And it, it was uh, amazing. It was amazing. And that song became, even in Europe, uh, it became popular. Nobody had understood what I was singing about, <laughs> but uh, they, they were singing along just the melody because it's such a beautiful melody. And I thought, this is cool. Here's a German band performing in France, uh, singing a Japanese song, <laughs> and the French audience is singing along, you know. And that's truly like, this is like about connecting the world, you know, through music. That's the story of the Scorpions right there, Klaus, in, in one uh, summary, and there's no doubt. That's such a classic record. I still can't believe how well that holds up after all these years. That whole record, Tokyo Tapes, from beginning to end, you can play the whole thing. You just marvel at it. It's amazing. Yeah. It's really... Uh, I, I leave you with one final question. Uh, you've been very generous, and, and I really do appreciate it. And it just... <clears throat> on the note of staying with something so long, you've seen a lot of changes come and go. You sing some of these songs, and some of them maybe have deep meaning for people in the audience. And as people come and go in your life, you lose people. Um, I lost my mom and grandma last year, so maybe I look at lyrics a little deeper. I wonder how loss has maybe shaped some of the way you, when you play your own music, you maybe, are there any of those songs that have a deeper or a different meaning to you now that you've grown and really had to experience the up and down of in, in personal life? Well, yeah... I mean, there, of course, there are some of the songs and, and some of the ballads. And, and, and of course, especially uh, when I perform songs from, from the Blackout album. And uh, then, of course, it, it reminds me on the days when uh, I lost my voice in the early 80s. And uh, for me, it was like like the end of the road, you know, and sure. I, I couldn't imagine that I could go on with the Scorpions. And this was, it was 82. It was, I think it was around the time when, when we later, when my voice came back, we recorded Blackout, and on that tour, I think we played in Honolulu as well. I think it was around that time. I must have been 82, I think. Hmm. Uh, and it was a difficult time. And today, sometimes performing those songs, then my mind goes back, and I'm, I'm very thankful that I, I'm still up there, and my voice still works, and uh, I still can live my dream. I hope this interview kept you engaged. I'm genuinely uh, grateful for your time, Klaus Mina, and the record is Unplugged, The Scorpions. I really appreciate it. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dave. Thank you. Hello, uh, this is Klaus Mina from The Scorpions, and you are tuned in into Dave Lawrence on Hawaii Public Radio. Let, let me do one more, okay? Sure, brother. Okay. Hello, uh, this is Klaus Mina from The Scorpions, and you turned... Oh, one more time. <laughs> Hello, this is Klaus Meiner from the Scorpions. You tuned in to Dave Lawrence on Hawaiian 105. No. Hello, this is Klaus Meiner from the Scorpions. And you tuned in to Dave Lawrence on Hawaii Public Radio. You're the man, Klaus. Big hug. And uh, thank you, dude. I hope this was okay. Fantastic. Thank you, Dave. Thank you very much. You're I welcome. It. Be, be safe, Klaus. Take care. Aloha. All right. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye then.